Hi there, David. We are honored to have you on the show here today. And while a lot of people in our audience may already know who you are, can you kind of give us the quick background on who you are and uh, what you do for everybody who doesn't know who you are already? Sure. Thanks for having me on, Jake. Um, so a little bit of background on me. Um, my name is Dave Bryant. I am based here in Vancouver, Canada, buried under three feet of snow here right now. Um, and I basically have been importing from uh, using Alibaba and importing from various uh, suppliers across the globe for, I guess, almost, uh, not almost actually, over 10 years now. So I started an e-commerce business back in around 2008 after I'd worked with a family friend uh, doing his web design and graphics design for a lineup of inflatable boats that he was importing at the time using a sourcing agent here in Vancouver. And I did this for a few years with them and then I started to realize, huh, you know, there's this new website, it was new at the time at least, called Alibaba.com. I started to realize that you could find almost any product in the world that you wanted to import on Alibaba.com. And I started to think, huh, you know, maybe I don't need to use a sourcing agent like my uh, boss was using at the time. And so I started hunting around on Alibaba looking for different products to import and eventually came up with what was probably the worst product ever to start importing. And I started to import boat anchors uh, from Alibaba.com. And a boat anchor, as you can imagine, is literally a 50 pound hunk of metal that you throw on the bottom of the ocean. Uh, like I mentioned, it was probably a bad product idea to start with, but it turned out okay because there wasn't a lot of competition at the time. The margins were good. And actually as a university student, I was definitely able to pay for uh, my beer and ramen at the time. And over the course of, I guess, the next seven or eight years, I grew this product lineup of boat anchors to include 30 or 40 different boating accessories. Eventually grew it to a company doing about two and a half, three million dollars a year in revenue. And in 2016, I sold that company, Anchoring.com. I uh, took some time off uh, with our family and actually moved to Xiamen, China, uh, basically for our daughter to learn some Chinese. And uh, while there, I started up another company, uh, importing off-road accessories so big products for uh trucks and jeeps and those types of cars uh and vehicles and currently run that company today actually offroading.com and i chronicle that on a blog and podcast that i run as well called ecomcrew.com i love that that's an amazing story uh, just super in incredible to hear how you got started and uh, the journey you've been on thus far and so really honored and excited to have you here on the show um so one thing I want to do dive into at a high level is you talked um, a bit in the past about how, you know, your sourcing strategy has changed from 2010 um, to where it is now. And so what would you say is different in e-commerce between now and then? Yeah. So the biggest difference that I've seen over the last 10 years is that when I first started over 10 years ago, you could literally import an undifferentiated product like a boat anchor and have pretty good success selling it because there wasn't a lot of competition at the time. Now there's definitely a lot more competition. So there's a lot of a bigger need to differentiate your product. So that's one of the things that I've really changed kind of my philosophy on over the last few years is, all right, let's figure out a product to import, but let's also figure out a way to differentiate it and kind of make it our own and have something that makes it stand out from the rest of the competition. So even if it's something like an ATV bag, basically a bag that goes on the back of an ATV vehicle. How can we make this bag a little bit different? Can we add some more pockets? Can we add kind of a cooler component to it so somebody can keep their beer and their hot dogs cold uh, while they're off ATVing? So figuring out some way to make these different little changes onto a product. It doesn't necessarily mean totally revolutionizing the product and making a completely different mousetrap. It's just finding something little to make it my company's own that's incredible and that makes a lot of sense where it, it, the market i think has shifted a lot to where there there's so much competition there's so many products you do need to um you know figure out find ways to differentiate i'm also curious from um, the actual sourcing side how has that changed from um you know previously you know has it changed from trade shows and in-person visits to kind of using more digital sourcing what else has kind of changed from like a technology or just how you're actually going about the sourcing process as well well, I guess a couple of things have changed. So when I first started using Alibaba.com, uh, like I mentioned, almost 10 years ago, there were a lot of suppliers on there, but there was nowhere near as many suppliers as there are today. Um, it's pretty uncommon today to 
not be able to find a supplier on alibaba.com. So now that directory on alibaba.com is way more complete. And it includes obviously everything from Chinese suppliers and Indian suppliers, even to American and Canadian suppliers. So uh, you have kind of the whole gauntlet of different suppliers uh, that you can choose from there. So back way back when in the day when I had to rely on trade shows a little bit more than I did now because that directory on alibaba.com was not as complete back then. Now, because you can find almost any supplier on there, it has eliminated kind of a lot of that need of visiting trade shows. Now, visiting trade shows still does help, but it's not as big of a requirement as it was uh, 10 years ago when I first started. Um, so that's been one of the biggest changes. Um, one of the other changes, and this is, I guess, kind of uh, different from how I'm necessarily sourcing suppliers. It's just on the logistics and supply end. Um, it's a lot easier now to import from basically anywhere in the world because there's a lot of... Uh, different services out there that can help you get your pallets of goods, whether it's from China or India or Vietnam, wherever it is, into my warehouse in Canada or America. So that end, the logistics end, has gotten way easier over the last, I guess, two or three years. Uh, that used to be a huge problem for me uh, when I first started. Okay, how do I get these goods from the factory to my warehouse here in Canada? Now it's not even really a second thought. It's uh, very seamless. There's, like I mentioned, tons of services out there that will help you get your goods from these factories, uh, and it couldn't be simpler. I mean, it's no different than shipping a box of chocolates to my grandma uh, 100 miles away in Kelowna uh, compared to shipping a whole bunch of pallets from a whole ocean away. So from a logistics end, far, far easier. That's incredible. And so when you're looking at kind of, you mentioned, you know, you need to find ways to make products unique these days and find ways to stand out. I'm curious, how are you identifying opportunities for unique products or what indicators are you looking to find trends or products that you should be bringing to market? Yeah, so I mean, the best way that I've found is if I'm using a product currently and I'm using it on a day-to-day -day basis or a weekend-to-weekend -weekend basis, and I can identify things that could just make this product a little bit different. Um, you know, one of the things that we, uh, that we import are tents. And one of the tents that we had just did not have good ventilation in it. So I started to think, huh, okay, could we add a little bit better ventilation to this, a few more windows? Um, the tent also at the time did not look great. It just stylistically, it didn't look uh, rough and tough, the kind of the image that I wanted. Uh, so I started to think about ways to kind of change the tent and make it a little bit more rough and tough and increase the ventilation. And then go to alibaba.com and try to find a supplier that's willing to make those changes. So that would be the first thing is if I'm using a product on a day-to-day -day basis and I can kind of identify just from using it on a day-to-day -day basis, things that I personally would want to make different and things that I would want to improve on that product. Uh, now, not every product that we import, I use on a day-to-day -day basis. And in that case, it's often just going to somewhere like Amazon or going through a brick and mortar retail store and looking at products and a lot of times there's just obvious things that you could do to make a product better like uh, often especially in e-commerce and uh, using these different channels like amazon or ebay a lot of times you'll buy a product there and the packaging is just really subpar and it gives you kind of a bad impression when you first get that product so that's one of the first things that i'll always look at differentiating and improving on a product is okay let's just see if we can make the packaging better because nobody wants to get a product off Amazon or eBay or buy it at a store and it looks terrible when you get it. And especially if you're gifting it to somebody or giving it to somebody, nobody wants a poor packaging experience. So that's one of the things that I would first initially look to improve. And then after that, look at things to actually physically improve the product and make it a better product. I love that. And so, you know, once you've maybe identified a product or an idea that you want to source, then how do you go about actually um, vetting suppliers from alibaba.com. You know, what does your typical process look like on that? Yeah, so the first thing I would do, okay, let's say I'm, I want to import this ATV bag. So I go into alibaba.com and I would try to find three to five suppliers that already sell this product. So try to find ideally five suppliers selling this product already and then reach out to them and say, hey, I want to add a couple more product, uh, pockets to this ATV bag. Can you do that for me? And when you reach out to the suppliers, 
Some of them are going, to, are going to say, you know what, we're not really interested in actually changing our products. We only want to sell you what we already have. And some of them are going to say, sure, we would love to do this. However, our MOQ, our minimum order quantity is 10,000 units. And for me, that might be too many units. So I would try to find that supplier who would say, yeah, sure, we're willing to do it. And we're willing to do it for a thousand units. And so it's trying to find that supplier that number one is willing to work with me to make those changes. And then number two, the supplier that's willing to work with me to make uh, those changes on a relatively small order, because I don't want to invest a hundred thousand dollars into a new product before I've kind of verified it and tested it a little bit. So that's my two step process. Number one, finding a supplier that's willing to make changes that I want to make. And number two, finding a supplier to work with me on a relatively small initial order. That's great. And when you're going through this process, are you utilizing the kind of verified supplier or the request for quotation features within Alibaba.com at all? Sure. So the RFQ feature, the request for quotation feature. Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of the starting step when contacting the suppliers is I try to get an RFQ from all these, uh, ideally five suppliers and figure out what the pricing is. Cause that's another filter mechanism too, for these suppliers. If their prices are too high, um, it's probably not going to work for us. So that would be the first thing is to, yeah, submit an RFQ to these suppliers. And in terms of verified suppliers, I use that as an initial filter criteria because ideally I want to work only with verified suppliers. And number one, uh, it obviously gives you some assurance that they've uh, done a little bit of their background uh, checks with Alibaba.com. But also aside from that, uh, you know, I haven't, I've never had a problem actually with any suppliers on Alibaba.com uh, being illegitimate or anything. Uh, but what the verified supplier check does is it kind of demonstrates a little bit of seriousness towards the platform and that they're, when you reach out to them, they're going to be a little bit more eager to get back to your emails. They're going to be a little bit more um, just agreeable to work with, just a little bit easier to work with. They'll respond quicker. They'll be more receptive to product changes and that type of thing. So the verified supplier check, I use it just to, kind of verify that that supplier is actually kind of committed uh, to working with customers like me. Nice. That's phenomenal. And, and so once you've got that kind of initial run of, you know, three to five suppliers that you think, um, you know, could be a good fit, or you maybe narrowed that down even smaller, you know, um, what about kind of negotiating with suppliers? You know, how do you handle um, that next um, phase of negotiation? And, you know, you mentioned previously that, you know, you used to fly internationally to kind of um, vet suppliers but i guess now that you're doing this digitally um you know what does that look like and you know maybe what are the advantages or you know some of the challenges that you kind of overcome as well with kind of digital yeah so when it comes to negotiation i mean i guess there's two parts to it there's there's like the negotiation of trying to get our product changes made and then there's the negotiation of trying to get our prices to a point that we want them at so in terms of the product negotiation just trying to get the changes made that we need to uh, one of the things that I found has really helped, especially with COVID and not being able to fly to these different factories is just hopping on a video call with them, whether it's through Skype or WeChat or any of the other video conferencing platforms and hopping on a video call with them and not just having your sales rep that you're talking to through Alibaba.com, but also getting somebody from the factory on the call with you and the sales rep and then that factory person. Because a lot of times when you reach out to somebody on Alibaba.com, What they are is that they're a sales rep with relatively good English. Their product expertise and engineering knowledge might not be that high. It's the person in the factory who probably doesn't really have any English knowledge um, that knows how the products work, what kind of changes you can make. So when I'm negotiating product changes, that's my first thing that I want to do is I want to get on a video call with a sales rep who's going to serve basically as a translator and somebody from the factory who can understand whether these changes are possible or whether they're not. And then when it comes down to pricing, um, again, a lot of it's kind of trying to play one supplier off the other and say, hey, Bob offered me $5 per unit and you're offering me $6 per unit. Is there anything that we can do to get that price lower to and closer to $5 per unit? Because that's kind of where we need to be. So again, that comes down to trying to get multiple quotes. And the more quotes that you can get, it, the easier it is to negotiate on price. And from there, um, you know, because there is such a selection of suppliers, on alibaba.com often it's pretty easy to find a supplier that is going to be able to give a price that i want yeah that's incredible and so um you know when you have narrowed that down to those final two to three suppliers you know um what are the factors you look for in that supplier who is the kind of final winner out of that you know maybe what red flags do you look avoid or what are the signs of uh that that this is like the one this is the right supplier yeah so there's a couple things 
that I'll do. Okay, number one is how responsive are they to my communication with them? So are they responding to my emails and my text messages within at least a day and not a week? Because if they're responding a week later, they're going to be hard to work with in the long term. So that's my first criteria is I want to find a supplier who's responding to me in a pretty prompt ma matter. After that, obviously, price really matters. And from there, in terms of kind of figuring out uh, what supplier it is that I want to work with and kind of verifying them. The other thing I'll do, and this is kind of a little trick, is when you're importing into America, at least, you can actually see a supplier's entire uh, export history to America. And there's a bunch of different services out there, everything from Jungle Scout to Import Genius. And you can actually see all the different shipments that they've made to America. And so I want to verify that they've actually made some exports to America. Because if they have had a long history of exporting to America, it probably means that they have some experience doing this and that their uh, quality of products are reasonable. Uh, so that would be the kind of the final thing that I would do is just kind of verify their export history a little bit, just to make sure that they have actually exported to America because that demonstrates a little bit of professionalism and experience. Yeah, that's great. And so, you know, once you say have identified the supplier, I mean, the next challenge is coordinating, you know, complex or custom orders. Um, and, you know, I'm curious, you know, how you go about this, you know, you've talked about, about, you know, doing customizations or trying to get really nice packaging as ways to differentiate the product. So, you know, how do you go about coordinating all of those small customizations with your suppliers? Yeah. So, I mean, this is one of the things that I think I've evolved in as an importer and gotten a little bit better at. And I remember when I first started importing, I would simply say, Hey, make me a better boat anchor. I don't know what a better boat anchor is, but make me one. And when you communicate an ambiguous outcome like that to a supplier, they're going to uh, kind of interpret it in their own language and uh, use their own subjectivity to determine what is a better boat anchor. And I've learned that really to have the best results, you want to communicate every little change that you can possibly make on a product. So if I'm importing an ATV bag, I want to define, okay, what kind of fabric do I want this ATV bag to be made of? Do I want it to be out of 300 denier fabric? Do I want it to be out of 600 denier fabric? Uh, do I want it to be a nylon uh, stretch cord? Or do I want it to be a polyester stretch cord? Where exactly do I want this pocket? What size do I want this pocket? And communicating every detail as much as possible. Because when you communicate as many details as possible, you leave it less up to interpretation by the supplier. And when you leave things up for interpretation, what I think and what Jake thinks are going to be two different things almost 100% of the time. So removing that margin of error and removing that level of interpretation that needs to be done would really just help make the process a lot cleaner and a lot more um, just a better experience overall. And, you know, a lot of people talk about um, having tech packs and a tech pack is like a technical term for having this specifications document of all the different changes that you want to make. Uh, yeah, we do that to a small degree, but really a lot of times it just comes down to taking a picture and like drawing arrows and adding text and saying, hey, put the pocket here and uh, we want it to, we want the logo over here and just using pictures a lot because pictures are universal. You don't need a language to communicate them. Uh, they communicate in themselves. So whether you're speaking uh, Punjabi or Vietnamese or Chinese, pictures go regardless of any language. That's great. Um... And so one of the other challenges that everyone is facing is clearly the supply chain and logistics. Um, and so, you know, over the past couple of years, we've seen uh, some of the biggest supply chain breakdowns since e-commerce has emerged. And so, you know, from your role um, and expertise in the industry, you know, can you share what you've seen um, in the market in terms of maybe both the challenges that are coming up as well as maybe some of the opportunities that can come up from that as well? Yeah. So, I mean, everyone I think who is importing right now knows of the supply chain or not supply chain issues, the logistical issues going on right now. And container prices have gone up, uh, at least for us, about 3x uh, in 2021 compared to 2020. Uh, so that's a bit of a hit to our profit margins. Along with the prices, though, has also been the lead time. So things are getting stuck at port, whether it's in China or any other country we're importing from or in America. Uh, whether it's Long Beach or Seattle, it seems every port is congested right now. So things are taking anywhere from two to three times as long and costing anywhere from two to three times as much. Uh, so those are the, the two big pain points. In terms of prices and getting those lower, I haven't found a great way. Um, 
just kind of trying to wait it out and hope that prices come down on container prices and also of course adjust our prices up a bit um you know it's inflation and if we keep our prices the same uh year after year after year eventually our prices are just going uh to put us out of business if we never raise them so making sure our prices are kind of being raised in line with our costs being raised now in terms of lead times you know we're trying to get our orders in as soon as possible so where we might place an order three months ahead of when we needed it now we're trying to place them five six sometimes even eight months in advance and get these orders into our warehouse as soon as possible because we know things can take a lot longer and right now in today's environment basically whoever has the inventory is the one winning so how can we get make sure that we are the ones to have inventory and my solution has been simply let's order as soon as we can that's great. And so, you know, with all the current, um, you know, supply chain disruption, you know, digital like global sourcing is said to be, you know, a solution to a lot of these trade and supply chain issues. And so, you know, what are your thoughts on kind of the shift toward digital sourcing? And, you know, can you share any, you know, change to your strategy over the past year as the shift's kind of been happening? Yeah, I mean, one of the big changes has been uh, definitely going to video conferencing. <laughs> Uh, to communicate with our suppliers, obviously visiting any supplier, no matter where they are in the world, it's just not practical right now. You know, hopefully that changes here in the next year or two, but right now it's not practical. And getting on a video call with suppliers is one of the most important things that I've found that I can do and not just doing everything through email and through text messages. And I'm somebody who would always prefer to do things through email and text messages, but it's not good for building rapport. It's not good for kind of communicating the non, uh, the nonverbal components of, of something and kind of gauging somebody's reaction and just seeing them face to face. So that's been one of the main things that I've changed is trying to get on a video call with suppliers, even though sometimes there's a bit of a language issue and it can be a little bit challenging uh, fighting through that and just building a little bit of the rapport that you can get more through video than you can through an email. So that's been one of the major changes that I've made. Um, in terms of everything else with uh, kind of battling through this pandemic, you know, we live in a globalized world where everything can be done uh, no matter where you are, uh, you can do it all remotely. So I think the challenges during the pandemic haven't been as big as they might've been, you know, if this happened 10 years ago where people weren't as comfortable jumping out a video chat. So I guess that's one of the kind of godsends that's happened through this pandemic is that it happened in 2020 and not 2010 where people weren't as comfortable doing everything remotely and through the internet. That's great. And so, you know, based on what we have seen in 2020 and um, 2021, you know, what should SMBs or B2B buyers be thinking about going into 2022? How can they, you know, adjust their operations and sourcing plans to best meet the needs of the market? Yeah, I mean, like I mentioned, one of the things that we're doing is we've now basically changed when we're making our orders. So we're making them basically 2x ahead of time so before when it was three months ahead of time that we'd place an order now we're doing it six months ahead of time so that's the first thing we're doing um uh, the second thing we're doing is you know we're having to hold more inventory simply for the fact that we don't necessarily have a predictable timeline for when a product might get from the country that we're importing it from into our warehouse so that's forced us to carry more inventory and that's put some cash flow demands on our company so trying to get more available cash flow. A lot of that goes down to just getting more lending from the banks. And the good thing about kind of the environment that we're in right now is that interest rates are low. So lending is relatively cheap. And so, yes, we're having to hold more inventory on hand. And I hate doing that, but thankfully interest rates are low. So the cost of doing that is lower than it would have been three or four years ago with interest rates where they are right now, basically 0%, uh, at least at this recording. Um, you know, obviously that's not the rate we get, but it's pretty close to zero uh, compared to other years. It's made holding more inventory more feasible. So that's something I think for everyone to think forward uh, to going ahead in 2022 is, okay, you probably have to hold more inventory. And what are the cash flow constraints that that's going to put on you as a company? And how do you alleviate some of those cash flow constraints? No, that's great. And and so now I want to dive into kind of some just sections more on advice as well. And so, you know, what um, tips would you share with the audience to, you know, better or more effectively use Alibaba.com? I know you've been using this tool for years. And so maybe what are some of the, the best features or tools or ways that you're using the platform that you would recommend others to think about? Well, I mean, 
definitely the communication with suppliers is the most important thing with Alibaba.com and getting lines of communication going with as many suppliers as possible. And just if you're thinking about in, importing, like I mentioned, an ATV bag, trying to communicate with two or three suppliers at the same time, because some of them are going to be able to offer what you want and some of them aren't. Um, some of the other features too, I mean, Alibaba.com now has a great, I don't know what they call it exactly, but it's kind of like a background check on the suppliers where they actually, for a lot of suppliers, they go in there and they do a video tour of the whole factory. And it does, it doesn't totally eliminate going to that factory and visiting a person, but it does give you the next best thing because you can often see a whole video tour of the factory in Alibaba.com and the people that they have on the ground in various countries doing these factory tours. Uh, it's pretty cool to see sometimes, uh, get a kind of an inside look at how the sausage is made inside these factories. So I uh, definitely, if you're on Alibaba.com and you're on a supplier's profile page, go to their About Us page and maybe they'll have one of these video tours. And it's just kind of neat, neat to see. A lot of times too, what you can see too is through these video tours, sometimes a factory does things that maybe they don't mention explicitly on their product pages within Alibaba. So when you look at these video tours, you can sometimes get an idea of different things that they might be able to make uh, and different product ideas. So definitely check that out. Uh, something Alibaba has done a great job of over the last few years is uh, kind of giving you a bit of an inside peek at how these different suppliers and factories are run and a behind the scenes look uh, with some of these video tours. That's phenomenal. And, um, so another question I ask is, you know, if you could go back and speak to your younger self, who was just kind of begin to building out your sourcing practice and your e-commerce journey, you know, what advice would you give your younger self? Yeah, I think one of the things that I kind of made a mistake of in the beginning was not expanding my product line as quickly as I probably should have. So, uh, when I first started importing, it was literally one boat anchor. And I thought, how can I sell a million of these Bruce style boat anchors per year? And the market was just simply not big enough to sell a million <laughs> Bruce style anchors. Uh, so I had to expand that product catalog. And so I think the younger me, I would have told, you know, look at expanding your product catalog a little sooner rather than later. And that's one of the things I learned with my new brand in the off-road space is right out of the gate, I try to find 10 different products to import. And some of those products are going to be home runs and do phenomenal. Some of them are going to do eh, okay. And some of them are just not going to do well at all. And if you take enough kicks at the can, eventually you're going to get a couple cans that go flying at our home runs and a couple of the cans are not going to go anywhere and you just have to discontinue them. But the more kicks that you get at the can, the higher likelihood you have of success and the bigger that you grow your catalog, normally that results in more revenue and more profit. Not always, but the majority of the time, a bigger catalog does kind of uh, reap rewards on the PNL. Yeah, that's phenomenal. And that's a, uh, it's a great insight there. Uh, and so as we wrap up, here, you know, Alibaba.com has been working a lot on helping, you know, global SMBs find better possibilities, you know, better access product sources and really support them in growing their businesses efficiently. And so as someone who has extensive experience sourcing internationally, are there any other final words of wisdoms you would share for all the SMBs out there listening today? Yeah. You know, um, I think the one last kind of tip I would give everyone is, really look at kind of differentiating and changing the products as much as possible. So Alibaba.com is great for showing you uh, different catalogs of suppliers and things that they're already making. But most of the suppliers on Alibaba.com are also eager to work with you on changing the products and making them a little bit different. Uh, and if you just ask, a lot of times they're eager to make different and better products. So uh, when you go on Alibaba.com and you see the product catalog, it's not a static thing. The, the suppliers are willing to work with you on different changes that you can make. And uh, it normally works out well for everyone. The supplier gets to kind of be a little bit innovative, innovative on their end and you get better products, which uh, you can probably sell better than the competition. Yeah, that's phenomenal. That's great advice, Dave. Um, and so as we wrap up here, you know, for anybody that does want to go find out more about you, your podcast or anything online, um, what's the best place to find you online? Yeah, sure. Um, EcomCrew.com is kind of uh, the best place to find me at. So it's a blog, a podcast that we've run for, geez, uh, almost seven years now. So uh, check it out, EcomCrew.com. And uh, yeah, I share a lot of my insights and uh, experiences doing this for the last 10 plus years. Perfect. Well, thank you for taking the time to come on here, Dave. Thanks a lot.